The final group that we're going to look at in some detail regarding its origin are horses. Uh, and horses are important culturally, culturally for humans. They're not as ecologically important as whales, certainly not as diverse or ecologically important as birds, but they're important for humans historically and culturally for many reasons. And there's also a fairly good fossil record of the evolution of horses. So we are going to go back to this time just right after the Cretaceous extinction, after most of those dinosaurs go extinct, the pterosaurs, the ichthyosaurs, plesiosaurs are all going out, and we have all these small mammals. And in that environment, we have this small group of mammals that diversified called the Perissodactyla. And Perissodactyla were very successful for a while, and there are still three main groups with several species in each group today. But they're much less successful than they were originally. They were all herbivores and remain so today. Um, but there again, you look at this and it doesn't really look like a horse. This is a very, very ancient ancestor and, and diversified into many other things. So Phenocotus is the earliest ancestor of the group Perissodactyla that would eventually lead to horses and other groups. But this is not in um, any form yet that would look like modern horses. So just know the Perissodactyla and the name Phenodacus. Again, as with the others, you don't need to memorize these dates, but you should be familiar with the names. Now, as I mentioned, there are many, many extinct lineages of these Perissodactyla. Some of them that got around kind of like big gorillas. Um, there were others that were related to or were in the group rhinoceroses. Um, this is the largest land mammal. Whales would get much bigger, but this is the largest land mammal compared to today with modern's largest mammal, the African elephant. These are brontotheres, so a very diverse group. And if you ever watch the movie Ice Age, you might recognize some of these or see some of these from Ice Age. There are only three groups that are still living today. So these are the extant ones, right? That's the opposite of extinct. But the extant groups, you should be familiar with these Perissodactyla. The tapirs, there are several species in South America and Southeast Asia. The rhinoceroses, which are Asian and African in distribution, and there are several species, many of which are highly endangered today, but they're still around. And then the horses. Now, this is including wild, all wild horses, including Peralski's horse, which is where our domesticated horses came from. It includes zebras, uh, wild onagers. Uh, look that up if you're not familiar. You don't need to know it, but and donkeys and, and asses are all part of this, what we would call modern horses. And again, there are several wild species, and then we have our domesticated horses that humans have for thousands of years bred and directed the evolution into useful work animals um, and service animals and maybe even argue companion animal. But um, they're quite different from their ancestors, although you look at it, the wild ones, you say, yeah, it's a horse, okay? So... The earliest thing that we would call horse from this horse record is Eohippus. Hippus is the Greek root, for root word for horse. Eo means dawn. So this is the earliest horse that we know of from the fossil record. And this is an artist's interpretation of what it may have looked like. Notice the differences between modern horses. It had four toes. You can see them up in the forelimbs very easily. It had teeth that were modified for grazing, but not nearly as specialized as modern horses, which are very highly modified for a grass diet. And then finally, it was much, much smaller. This is about the size of a large cat, small dog. So this was around 55 million years ago. Now we're, again, 10 million years or so after the extinction of the dinosaurs. The next one you need to know is Mesohippus. Horse names are easy. Again, I don't care that you memorize and know exactly every feature of each one, but be somewhat familiar with these names. Mesohippus means the middle or intermediate horse uh, from 35 million years ago. Now notice, and we're going to trace these, all three of these are trends. We can't see their teeth, but their teeth are becoming more modified for a specialized grass diet. They have now three toes. You can see it here, one, two, three toes instead of the four toes in the Eohippus. And they're getting larger. So now we're at a large dog size, uh, but still nowhere near what we'd say with modern horses. And these were grazers. They were probably also very susceptible to um, carnivores. Um, they evolved in North America, and that's another critical thing. Everything that we've talked about so far, Eohippus, uh, Mesohippus, are completely North American in distribution. Um, the next one, Merichippus, is a, and I accidentally cut off its head in this image, but notice, although it still has three digits, 
Two of them are now vestigial, and we're getting, it's still like pony-sized, right? So maybe a really, really big dog or a pony, um, but it's getting much bigger than its ancestors. And so these are general trends. We see reduction in the digits. We see larger and larger size as time progresses onward, and we see further modification of the teeth into processing grass instead of just general foliage. Okay, so vestigial toes, but still three toes. Now notice, and this is quite interesting, that horses evolve to walk on a single digit. Not only that, but they're walking on their phalanges, their fingers essentially, on the very end of that. So if you look at a horse's limb, right, this is the um, femur, right, analogous to your, homologous actually, to your femur. There's their radius and ulna, sorry, femur, tibia, and fibula. Radius and ulna are in the foreleg, but. Uh, tibia and fibula, and then these are their wrist bones, essentially, right? So that would be the equivalent of your wrist is right there, and wrist bones, and then phalanges, finger bones, and the early ones walked on four fingers, but now this guy's walking on just that one single middle uh, finger. So horses are really, really highly modified, and this is one of the reasons why uh, as we breed them to get stronger and faster that often they have quite severe injuries is because they've kind of been pushed the limits physical limits of what they can support on that one digit. Okay, Pleohippus is the last fossil horse we're going to look at. Uh, he comes from about 10 million years ago, so very, very similar and close to modern wild horses. And nearly about the same size. Wild horses are quite smaller on average than uh, most of our modern domesticated horses, which we bred on purpose to become bigger and stronger in most cases. Although, you know, ponies were kind of taken the other way from these uh, uh, wild horses. And today we have wild asses and donkeys, we have several species of zebra, and a, a handful of wild horse species of which we have domesticated those. Um, so the last four million years we've has seen a diversification. Now, all of these species up until Pleohippus were found completely in North America. And it's not until very recently, again, about 10 million years ago, that we see migration. Pleohippus, we don't have their fossils, but we have some close relatives of them, um, migrating into the old world. And so about 10 million years ago, we began to see horses not only in North America, which is their homeland, where they evolved from, but we begin to see them spreading across the steppes of Asia and eventually, much more recently, down into Africa, leading to our modern zebras. And this is a, an important concept because... Uh, horses in North America eventually went extinct. And so by the time humans began to come into North America, the horse was on its way out and, and may have even been extinct before humans got there. Or humans may have hunted and helped hunt horses to extinction in North America. There's uh, not enough data to have a very clear answer on that. But eventually, horses go extinct in their homeland of North America, but they maintain species across Asia and down into Africa. Um, and so our modern domesticated horse ar arises from those Asian populations. And eventually it was brought back into America, even escaped, and, and there are now wild horse herds in North America. And just this kind of very romantic idea of Native Americans riding around on horses, right, or, or hunting or fighting on horseback. That was true. They adopted the horse very readily, but it wasn't until Europeans brought the domesticated ones back to America after they had been extinct in America um, from for uh, millions and millions of years. And most likely the horse was gone. Uh, records of American, um, I'm sorry, of, of humans in America go back now about, some people push it back as, as far as 18,000 years ago. And almost certainly the horse was gone, although there again may have been a little bit of remnant species that, that humans helped to hunt and push out, but uh, it doesn't seem to be a major um, factor in their extinction. 